Okay, welcome. Um, it's two o'clock. I'm a stickler for starting on time, so if we could start on time. Uh, my general philosophy is come and go as you like. I won't take it as a protest if you get up and run out uh, and invite people to come in with lunch or without lunch. Uh, I'm uh, Bill Eskridge. I'm one of the reunion classes. I think the brains of my class are back there on your far right, you know, uh, waving at us all. Um, and on the whole, we are not a very technological class. You know, we were still doing shepherds and pulling books off the shelves when we were in law school, so technology has somewhat overtaken us. And uh, I'm maybe not the most uh, appropriate person to do a technology presentation. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, for the last two semesters, I have been teaching uh, with my co-teachers, Theo Rostow, the grandson of Dean Rostow, over there to your left in the red robes, uh, and his law partner, Jeff Chivers, who've been teaching a course on AI and the legal profession. Uh, and so uh, here are some slides that will give you some ideas that we've come up with. Uh, all of these are very provisional. Uh, and so your speculations and questions are certainly uh, welcome at the end. Uh, first of all, just what are we even talking about? Uh, and that's not widely known in our generation. Uh, most of us are familiar with TurboTax and other more primitive computer programs that are basically conditional logic programs. You know, if A, then B, if B, then C, and so on and so forth. And this is very valuable stuff, uh, but that's not what we're talking about today. We're not talking about uh, even very complicated uh, primitive programs that can, for example, do tic-tac-toe and never lose. But these more primitive programs cannot do chess. So when you read about chess machines beating grandmasters, uh, that's probably deep learning that you're reading about. And uh, that's what we have in the slide, if you can see it right, right above me. Uh, deep learning is computer programs that do not operate under conditional logic. They operate under a much more complicated mechanism where there are multiple thousands, millions of feedback loops uh, that produce uh, advancement in the computer's ability to answer questions. Uh, many of you are familiar with GPT-3, 3, 3, 5, or 4. Uh, GPT-3 is an example, or 4 is an example of deep learning. Uh, and this is a very simplified sort of illustration. Uh, what the algorithm in uh, uh, deep learning and in GPT in particular is, it's just numbers. Uh, each word is represented by a vector which is many numbers following one another. Uh, and everything that GPT does is numerical. So when you feed in a verbal question or in interrogation, uh, and those are the uh, green buttons, uh, it immediately translates those words into numerical vectors and then runs them through uh, many, many thousands, maybe millions of those uh, vertical rows of blue buttons uh, which then process the question, and basically, but in numbers. And you can graph the numbers, and you don't know what they actually stand for in GPT's algorithm. Uh, and it's basically uh, an algorithm that produces the predicted word that follows the words preceding it. So it's not conditional logic. It's a predicted word game. And then after millions, maybe even billions of interactions within these uh, vectors, uh, within these uh, blue lines, you get uh, the uh, yellow, which is an answer that it translates from the numbers uh, into uh, the uh, verbal. And then this is just a little step up, not much of a step up uh, in terms of complexity. <clears throat> but, but think of this, multiply this by a thousand, a million. Now, where are we on AI? Notwithstanding all the vaunted claims that are made for AI and its various products, which is not just GPT, uh, in my opinion, uh, AI presently cannot quite do legal reasoning as well as you all can. Now, every year this is changing. Uh, my class is deteriorating in its ability to do legal reasoning, and GPT is accelerating. So within two years, except for Carolyn Williams and Pat Profeta, I think GPT will be ahead of the rest of us 
uh, and uh, soon catch up even with them. And here are some things that I don't think GPT and some of the other algorithms do all that well. They can find precedent. Sometimes it's not a real precedent. It's a phony one. It's an hallucination. That's a problem. But even when it finds the real precedents, it's not necessarily all that good at the kind of nuanced distinguishing of precedents. What does a precedent stand for in light of all this stuff that has come after it, and so on and so forth? Uh, in my opinion, as mainly as a teacher of statutory interpretation, which is one reason why some of you are probably find it odd that I'm standing up here on artificial intelligence, um, because intelligence has never been used in the last year to describe Congress. Uh, but uh, <coughs> artificial intelligence, in my opinion, is not very good at statutory analysis. Now, you can plug in and it can tell you, oh, here are sources of what vehicle means, here are sources of what personal privacy means, et cetera, et cetera. It can be very useful study aid or like a get started mechanism, but it's not very good at doing structural analysis, which is what you've got to do now for statutes. So you might be focusing or homing in on a particular word, but the word is going to be embedded in phrases, in sentences, in statutory structure, maybe even in the whole code. And ChatGPT is not very good at that. Uh, it's also, uh, it's pretty good sometimes at, at giving you sometimes things you wouldn't find otherwise, little bits of relevant evidence, like word meaning. But it's not very good at interacting the little bits of information that it finds, like here, here's what vehicle might mean uh, in the abstract, but in the context of a sentence, you cannot drive a vehicle into the park because blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's not as good at putting all of that together, uh, all sorts of various things like legislative history, purpose, precedent, word meaning, phrases, etc. Um, I don't think it's so fantastic at applying legal principle to facts and equity. Uh, if you plug in equity, ChatGPT will usually say something like, I'm just a computer, you know, I don't really know very much, I'm not even legal, and I was last updated in January of 2022, and then it will spew out some interesting things about equity, but without answering your question. Not very good at adjusting for institutional considerations. Um, and it's not very good at normative judgments. If you ask it to make normative judgments, it'll say, well, I'm not very normative, I'm just a computer, you know, I'm just a bill, a hopeless bill, falling down the hill, etc. cetera. Um, so you, you don't get a whole lot of normative analysis, particularly when it's a complicated normative analysis like what, what lawyers often have to do. Uh, now, in my opinion, e even with these limitations, uh, the uh, artificial intelligence uh, mechanisms, not just GPT, but the TAR uh, Technology Assisted Review, to take maybe the main example. Uh, I believe that the new technology has already transformed the practice of law. Now, admittedly, very unevenly, but it's already transformed the practice of law, and the transformation, I think, is only accelerating. We'll say a little bit more about that in, in a minute. Uh, so, for example, for clients, you do need now see uh, interactive websites. Uh, you see client management, including client billing, <laughs> is uh, <clears throat> now often done on the cloud uh, through some kind of, uh, not very complicated, but some kind of technology. Uh, a lot of the routine tasks of lawyers, uh, and you see on the slide some of them that occur to me anyway, uh, uh, can now be done much more efficiently with artificial intelligence. So for example, if you just have five documents in your case, well, okay, you just have five documents, but let's say you have five million documents potentially relevant to your case, either from your own client or through discovery from the other side or from, from wherever. Uh, ChatGPT, whether it's a discovery matter or not, can really help you find most of the relevant documents. And at least in some studies, they can do it more accurately than a hapless associate. So the hapless associate might take a thousand hours at Lord knows what the billing rate is and still make more mistakes, find fewer relevant documents than chat GPT in five minutes. Wow. Now it takes more than five minutes to, you know, to, to create a, a, a seed set and to fine tune it and so on and so forth, but it's still a big efficiency thing. Um, it has obvious relevance for discovery Technology-assisted review has been around, I think, at least a decade. Uh, TAR is already on TAR3, 
and I presume it will get better and better. Uh, chat, uh, the ChatGPT and the associated doctrines can take quasi-long documents and summarize them, boil them down for you, very intelligently usually. Uh, I don't think it's as good at generating documents like memoranda, maybe letters, but memoranda or briefs, I don't think it's as good at that, though it can give you a pass. That it can do already, but I think it's pretty good at boiling it down. And then legal research, um, you know, gone are the days uh, when you pulled out shepherds and the cases off the shelf. We now have Westlaw and Lexis. Westlaw and Lexis are, are, are already, they have developed and they will continue to develop uh, artificial intelligence mechanisms to make them more efficient. Uh, as you may know, Thomson Reuters, which owns uh, Westlaw et al., has just acquired case text, uh, our alum, uh, Laura Safdie, is the general counsel there, and case text is uh, the creator of co-counsel, which is a, a very good legal assistance website. So you can only expect, in my opinion, the wedding of of uh, co-counsel and Westlaw to be more efficient. Uh, this is just a stupid estimate I found on the internet. Okay, can you know take up to 23% of lawyers every day taxes. Who knows if that's right? Uh, but it certainly does, uh, maybe some GPT thing generated that. So it might be an hallucination. Uh, in litigation, which is kind of what I teach, uh, at Yale next uh, fall, we will Rostow, Chivers, and Eskridge, we will be teaching a small group in procedure uh, on an AI platform where all of the writing and research will be done on the AI platform. And the students will be trained in that from the very beginning to use with however they want. Um, so I do think, and this is why we came up with our course on the legal profession and procedure, uh, that AI has particular interest and relevance for litigation. Uh, it can already make very useful predictive judgments uh, depending on how rich your set of data might be. It can make predictive judgments on whether you should bring suit, can give you some help on that, where you should bring suit, and even what to ask for in terms of the amount of money. Now, again, you, you, you know, inflate whatever you want to do, uh, and you bring suit where you, where you would like to bring suit, i.e. maybe where you have a home office, but it can give you helpfulness on that. Uh, E-discovery particularly in large document cases, uh, TAR is very, very useful and it is increasingly used. Uh, and it is used in drafting legal documents, which I'm a little bit skeptical of, and I'm sure you've all read about the New York lawyer uh, who put hallucinations in his brief, and the judge on the other side said, well, where do these cases come from? And he asked GPT, and they said, hey, these are real cases, says GPT. Now, I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a computer, but these are real cases. So he doubled down. And they said, no, these are not real cases. And then uh, he was humiliated, of course, and became a national embarrassment. Uh, though, uh, OK, I'll give you a prize. Uh, what was his penalty? Does anybody know that? What was the sanction for repeatedly lying to the court and misrepresenting the law? Anybody know the answer to that? Bingo! We have a winner. You get tenure at the Yale Law School. That's what that's worth. OK, yeah, that's right. A fine of $5,000. Now, I think next time around, I think the fines might start getting stiffer. Um, so, so that's barely an introduction. Uh, obviously, uh, AI has huge relevance for mergers, acquisitions, con huge big jumbo contracts. Uh, it can be very useful in helping you catch errors or hear things that have been left out, maybe intentionally, but just give you, this has been left out of the standard documents along these lines. Uh, now, what about the structure of legal practice? Uh, many of us in the class of 78 are retired, but a lot of you look like you're spring chickens compared to me, and so this is my, probably still relevant for you. Uh, I think AI uh, has already had some impact, and it's going to have more impact uh, over the remainder of this decade. Um, clear personnel changes. Uh, a lot of young lawyers are very worried, will there be fewer jobs for us? And I certainly think without making a firm prediction, which I'm incompetent to make, uh, that there will be a reduced need in your typical law firm, particularly the big ones, for your junior attorneys and paralegals, and an increased need for teched up staff and managers, which, by the way, might include attorneys and paralegals, right? 
Uh, so my advice, on the, uh, I did a presentation at the D.C. Bar, the Connecticut Bar, and in both instances I got questions from young attorneys. What would you tell them? I'd say, well, you might take some computer science courses in college, uh, and you might get a lot of experience in AI because there's going to be more demand for you and less demand for, for people like me who are techno not very good. Uh, client relationships, here's my big prediction. Uh, this is not distinctive to me. But I think particularly with the uh, erosion of discovery costs probably in these big cases, uh, we, we already are seeing, including in the Shivers and Rostow law firm, we already are seeing a movement away from billing by the hour to billing by the task. Now look, when I was in private practice, we sometimes billed by the task. So this is not new. But I think we're going to see a big erosion in that. And some of it will be demanded by clients. Um, and then the structure of law firms. And this is very simple-minded, I admit, but it gives you maybe a general idea. I think in the structure of law firms, you're going to have a movement away from the traditional model, which I realize you've already moved away from. Uh, we have equity partners at the top, then a layer of maybe a zoftig layer of associates, uh, and then a lot of support personnel. Well, I realize law firms have already moved away from that. You have non-equity partners, you have permanent associates, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and indeed, I think law firms, the big ones, look more like corporations now than they do traditional law firms. You know, managing committee and subcommittees and bureaucracy, et cetera, et cetera. But I think um, the basic structure is going to move away from the old triangle to this new one where you still have partners or lawyers or whatnot who run it, uh, you can have other lawyers doing whatever, but a big chunk of it's going to be technology. Uh, and then you're also, law firms are already offloading a lot of tasks uh, to uh, other uh, entities. So that's the way I see uh, law firms going. Uh, uh, and, and the Theo uh, Rostow law firm is just two attorneys. And they're handling big consumer and worker rights cases. And they are humiliating big firms that are trying to use the usual uh, some of the usual big firm tactics, like hiding documents, deluging them, and so on and so forth. Um, this is wantonly speculative, so I invite your substitute speculations. Uh, almost all of you know a lot more about the practice of law than, than, than I do, at fancy schmancy firms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But here's my speculation for what it's worth. Um, th there will be winners and losers, uh, as there often uh, is when we have new technology. You know, the railroad comes in, automobile comes in, losers are uh, people who put shoes on horses and people who, you know, ride Pony Express. And winners, of course, are auto mechanics. So the winners, I think, uh, may be class action firms. Uh, this is going to make class actions more doable, uh, notwithstanding Supreme Court decisions that seem to make class actions undoable, like the Walmart and Dukes decision. But is this going to help you on the Walmart issue of we not only have common facts and issues, but we have a lot of common answers that magic mathematics and AI can demonstrate to you and can boil these cases down into subclasses, remember, that Rule 23 allows you to do. Corporate law departments. Uh, if I were a general counsel uh, of a corporate law department, uh, what I would be doing is doing more work in-house I would be hiring, you know, computer teched up lawyers and computer teched up computer people and creating my own data set. If I were general counsel of Walmart, which would be a very irresponsible Walmart, uh, then I would use their massive amounts of data on consumer and employment issues to create a data set which would enable me to sort of normalize, you know, here's what the response should be to various kinds of fact situations and cut out a lot of lawyers, right? And if I do retain lawyers, like you, or you, or you, even Carolyn Williams, you, I'm going to uh, uh, say, I, I just want a flat fee. And four out of five of you are going to say, not us. You know, we're going to bill by the hour. And I'm going to say, well, OK, bye-bye. We don't need you. We're going to go with Rostow and Shivers and then the successors to Ross John Shippers. And then uh, I think big winners will be the big firms that get the best AI technology early. 
because they're not only going to have the ability to invest a lot of money in AI, but they're also going to be able to use their richer data sets and their richer documents to sort of train the AI to make their practice maybe super efficient. Losers, there will be losers. Uh, I, I get calls from big firms every so often, and I usually frighten them, or they pretend to be frightened, uh, that big firms that move slowly are going to lose corporate clients because other firms will be able to underbid them and say, we're going to give you a flat fee. Uh, correlatively, firms that move too quickly and adopt soon obsolete tech, they might lose as well. <laughs> There's an irony. And then small practitioners who don't adapt, uh, they could also be losers. It's kind of hard to tell. Uh, robo-lawyers, well, we already have robo-lawyers. We already have interactive websites. Uh, we already have do not pay, which I'm sure rankles some of you those of you who know the rules of ethics, as all of you should, okay, <clears throat> will know that this probably violates 5.5. And uh, most states, including California and Connecticut, D.C. has a uh, court rule, uh, most states have particular statutes that very broadly prohibit them on authorized practice. And there is a serious lawsuit against do not pay in California, which does hold itself out as a, as we, we represent you. <clears throat> I think a more, uh, another promising avenue, though, this may be been underexplored, and that is legal aid, law school clinics, and other nonprofits might be able to use AI to represent more clients <clears throat> because I think all these groups, particularly the Yale clinics, you know, we, we are doing God's work. We're doing wonderful work. It's not only education for the students, but I think more importantly, it's good for the population of greater New Haven. <clears throat> but we cannot represent all that many people, right? And with AI, doing triage, helping do research, helping generate uh, information documents, helping organize facts and stuff, we, I think, could probably represent more people, uh, uh, even in our clinics. And you could see legal aid here in, in New Haven also being able to do the same thing. Now, having said that, I will immediately admit the Feridian case, and in California, if you always live in California, uh, in California, robo-lawyers have been mainly resisted by the plaintiff's class action bar and by legal aid, right? So <clears throat> the places where we're able to experiment, which we are uh, in uh, uh, doing uh, AI-assisted legal representation of some sort, are Utah, very red, kind of Mormon, Arizona, maybe kind of purple, and the next frontier, you heard it first here, is Chief Justice Hecht of the really red Texas Supreme Court. California legislature ain't got no. Nope. California legislature killed a bill that was supported by the California Bar Association. So it's very interesting. Uh, so there you have a little robo-lawyer uh, who's under. Now what about legal ethics? Well, I think this poses huge legal ethics issues that I think everybody needs to know about uh, because everybody, I think, ultimately is, is going to have to rely on AI for at least some stuff, uh, particularly discovery and maybe other things. Um, so there is a model rule. The ABA rules are pretty much inculcated. I'm a member of the D.C. bar, so I know the D.C. rules. And both in model rules in D.C. and I think in Connecticut, um, the competence rule does require you to keep up with technology. Now, you, you, you look worried. You're not going to be disbarred for that. But it is an obligation that seems to me we have, particularly if you talk about my practice. What about client communications? <clears throat> if you're using AI for client documents, uh, in my opinion, and the opinion of, of uh, all of the ethics experts I've talked to, which is not a large number, in Connecticut, D.C., California, those, those places mainly, <clears throat> and the ABA to a certain extent. If you're using AI uh, to process client documents, you've got to tell the client about it. And I think you, you also, in your retainer letter or in something, you need to uh, inform the client in some detail about not only you're using AI, uh, many experts do not think that's sufficient, but what you're using it for, what are the advantages, it might be billing, uh, what are the disadvantages, risk, 
say you have a third party vendor, third party vendors can see the underlying data, most of them. Well, I think the client needs to be told about that. The DC bar agrees with me, I think. Um, but this, this is obviously not a litigated issue. So I think there are <clears throat> a lot of, so 1.4 and 1.6, uh, client communications and confidential information, uh, I think are very key. Uh, and, and, and my personal view, uh, when I practiced law, was at Shea and Gardner. Okay, Williams and Connolly would just womp on poor little Shea and Gardner, but it was a very ethical firm, Shea and Gardner was. And uh, our philosophy would have been that we t would take all this very seriously and we would actually have actual conversations with the client and not just some kind of boilerplate letter. Um, I'm sorry, there's those rules uh, if you want them. Uh, we'll, we'll put this on the website. I'm not capable of that, but somebody is. There are obviously property issues involved in all of this. <clears throat> like when you use uh, TAR and the attorney creates a seed set of like documents that would be responsive, would not, uh, trains, trains the algorithm, and then fine tunes it, you know, how much of that is work product and doesn't have to be disclosed? Because as the cases get bigger and bigger, particularly when it's asymmetrical, you know, it's a big corporation versus a little firm, uh, the little firm is not going to trust the big corporation, often with good reason. <clears throat> so they want to know, what are your prompts? What was your mechanism? We want to know this. And the response is going to be, this is work product. Well, do we have substantial need under Rule 26b3? And these are issues where I don't think there are any Court of Appeals decisions and where the answer is still being debated among the courts. Uh, trade secrets, if you license from a third party, to what extent is that a trade secret? If you generate your own data training set, to what extent is that a trade secret? You know, these are all property issues <coughs> um, that we don't teach at the Yale Law School. Do you supervise? Um, the, the, you're better familiar with this than I am. I never supervised anything. Um, I was a supervisee. <clears throat> but you do have duties to supervise under 5.1, 5.3, and 1.6F. <clears throat> and that does apparently mean you have a duty to supervise your little robo assistant. Not just your paralegals and the junior associates, but your little robo assistants. You have a duty to supervise them. <clears throat> and so the lawyer who kept handing in the made-up cases uh, was not only you know, in contempt of court to some extent, and certainly in violation of the discovery rules or the certification rules under either Rule 11 or Rule 26, <clears throat> but was also in gross violation of uh, the duty to supervise in the, the New York uh, bar. Uh, so this is very serious as well. Now, there's some meta issues that we're interested in at the Yale Law School uh, that, uh, that are not how the practice of law is structured by the cartel rules that have been put in place. Uh, so the cartel gives you 5.4D, you can't have non-lawyers as equity partners, and you have 5.5 and many state statutes that prohibit the unauthorized, unauthorized practice of law. So to what extent can you create pilot programs or experiments like they've done in Utah, Arizona, and maybe Texas soon that make uh, that provide greater access to justice. Um, most, so like 70 to 80 percent of the people who are in the court system, federal and state, are unrepresented by lawyers. And then, of course, there are untold millions who have legitimate legal claims and are not even able to press them because they don't have legal advice telling them that you might have a legal claim here. <clears throat> uh, and normatively, this is what we feel at Yale, Judith Resnick, Abby Gluck, and I feel at Yale. We think this is the big issue for the court system. There are many very important issues. We think this is the big issue, the grotesquely unequal rationing of legal services and legal advice and then you put on top of that the Mark Galanter thing that we teach at Yale of repeat players coming out ahead, that even when the one-shotters do get into court, uh, they don't do as well as they should on a consistent and systematic basis uh, because the repeat players have played for the rules in case after case, etc. And many of you represent 
repeat players, and you have an obligation to pursue their interests. Now here I'll conclude with this, um, and that is uh, how uh, AI is going to change legal education. Uh, now Yale, I think, will be a lagging law school, but be that as it may, the world is going to move on, <clears throat> notwithstanding the Yale Law School. Uh, I think in the first year, uh, the law students are already using GPT-4 or 3. 4, I think you have to pay $20 a month. They're already using it. Um, some schools are already integrating AI into legal writing instruction. Some of you are thinking, whoa, no one will know how to write. They already don't know how to add and subtract because of the iPhone. And now they're not going to know how to write either. Good point. Good point. But, you know, it's a tsunami. Uh, to what extent can the law professor prevent them from using uh, GPT? Well, there's actually an AI program <laughs> where you can check if more than 20%, I believe, is the number of the answer comes in from GPT, it will be, you can use this program and it will flag. So you're already developing some technology. But in the course that we're going to develop next fall, we will probably have at least one small writing assignment, and it will be just use chat GPT for this writing assignment. We're going to have a lot of writing assignments. The Yale School does not competently teach legal writing or legal research, in my opinion. It teaches a little bit, but squeezing into the first semester is a bad idea. Now, you don't need ChatGPT to tell you that. I see some students, and they're shaking their heads like, oh, yes, you're understating it. Bad idea. So uh, uh, AI will possibly enable schools like Yale that underteach legal writing and research to give more students the facility uh, to uh, do that at an advanced level you know, after the first year. Uh, there's our course. Uh, there's Rosella. Rosella's sitting over there. Um, uh, she was a student. Uh, you don't recognize her without her mask on. Uh, this is the course that Theo. Theo is uh, on the left-hand side there, and there I am, and there's Jeff on the right-hand side. Um, and th this is the little seminar we taught last spring on AI and the legal profession, et cetera, et cetera. We're teaching again this fall. And we're, it's going to be the launching point for the small group that we want to teach next fall, which I think Dean Gherkin is going to let us do. Uh, advanced courses, <clears throat> I would say, you know, we're already offering, Kathan Ramakrishnan is offering a course on AI and public policy. Uh, Femi Kadmus, our librarian, uh, offers a course on AI and research. Uh, this is not, not nearly enough. Georgetown uh, is more the center for this. They offer a number of courses by regular faculty members like Paul Ohm and by adjunct faculty members uh, that tackle uh, uh, AIs can be relevant to a whole range of issues. Copyright is one that occurs to me. But I, I don't know anything about copyright, nor does anybody here, so we're not going to do that for a while. But our alum, Emily Chapuy, is the Deputy General Counsel of the Copyright Office, and she's going to help me on that one. Um, and then I think, here's my vision, this might be delusional, but in my vision, Yale should pride itself on its clinical programs. Uh, Georgetown, Yale, NYU, these are all great clinical programs. But again, we're limited in the number of people we can represent and help. Uh, and it seems to me one possible future, I think it is going to be a future for, for clinical education, uh, again, is not to reject the model we've been following very successfully, but to supplement it, and in addition to students maybe more efficiently representing clients with the assistance of AI triage, document production, document gathering, factual investigation, but also for universities in coordination with the Bar Association uh, so that we do it right, to come up with pilot programs where you create interactive websites, which can not only give you know, unlawyered folks uh, accurate legal advice that is monitored by the law school and the clinic, but also help them draft legal documents and tell them where they can file them. Now, at some point, maybe you can even have people already talk about uh, putting a little earphone in your ear in small claims court and having AI give you your legal arguments as well. And that, that's going to come as well. So I think that's all I have to say. And I... Uh, appreciate your attention.